We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is episode number 87 of the Fine Answers podcast. This is a back-to-back one. We've, we're jumping straight into another episode because we've got Amy, practice manager uh, extraordinaire. We wanted to talk, you actually raised this topic, maybe Ben suggested it, and you went, yes, let's talk about mm. that. And it was potential reduction in interest rates from the current highs where they are at the moment and what preparation people should be making to take advantage of that reduction. Now, Amy... Why is this topical to you? Let's start. Oh, I was Let- gonna say, Ben, ben will know why I want to talk about it because it's topical to me and a lot of my friends in this position, in this, in this, around this age. Okay, so explain to me why. What are you thinking about you? So obviously, you're not a financial advisor; you're a practice manager, but you're also, uh, well, you're a client. You're a client of this mm-hmm. business, and you, uh, you've got a mortgage. I hope that's okay to say that. Yeah, and okay. you've been impacted by interest rates positively and also negatively do you want to talk about your experience if you don't mind yeah i think i'm okay talking about it um so i was lucky enough to be one of the people that locked in a really low interest rate quite a while ago did your advisor tell you to do that or did you just wing it (laughs) ben you did i i i at that time it we didn't realize obviously that locking in a low interest rate would be so good do you but mind me asking what you locked it in at? 1.99. Yep. Is it still sitting at a fixed rate? It's still at fixed till February next year. Holy dooly. So, so it, it was a three-year fixed rate. If you could have wanted for to do anything with your interest rates and lock it in, what Amy's done at not your direction, Ben. No. <laughs> well, you can, you can claim. I gave her a wink and a nudge. It's a good idea. <laughs> You've nailed it. But a lot of people haven't nailed it. But the other thing that's coming for you is the... The cliff. The cliff, mm. Yeah. The cliff and uh, the rise, even if interest rates come down, there's still a, a jump. So there's probably two parts of this. There's the part of the very small proportion of people that are in Amy's uh, boat that were very fortunate to have um, locked in at low rates and are expecting a massive jump at some point. And then there's the people that have suffered from the variable rate rise and are anticipating some reductions. There's some suggestion that uh, maybe a couple of rate reductions this year, maybe, Ben, yeah, what do you no reckon? No one likes to, again, you're sort of throwing darts at the dartboard a little bit, but I think, again, we get research from all different corners of you know the economist world. I think late this year probably seems to be somewhat of a consensus. Some people are a bit more you know, buoyant around a July, August sort of time frame. I've probably leaned towards October, November, but that's just being a little bit of a pessimist. Uh, I think the key is that we feel like we're probably at the top of that cycle. So we've probably reached the peak and now we're going to be in a bit of a holding pattern unless something alters drastically in the, in the economy. So now we're in the hold pattern. It's, it's sort of, for me, I think it's like time to start looking ahead again and start to get organized for what that is. So again, you've got people who are still in fixed rates and always there's people progressively rolling out probably every day of the week at the moment, Mm -hmm. still coming out of that. Um, and then trying to reposition themselves for, all right, what do I do now? Probably what I would say is you, you've sort of just got to ride that variable rate for, for a little while so, here and get some, okay, get so some we, clarity. So are you assuming this is the person that's already on a variable rate that's copying the the, uh, the the elevated rates right now? Yeah, or they're just rolling it, about to come out of fixed too. Like okay. anyone who's sort of in that about to be or is currently in there, you probably, any of this where fixed rates are dangerous generally, like people have benefited from fixed rates in the last, let's call it five, six, seven years, but Prior to that, you know, you were fixing at a higher rate for the stability. You were paying a premium for stability. Cash flow consistency. Yeah. You were not paying. You weren't trying to play the game of will they go up or down. Like rarely was that actually the case. For a lot of people, they've pretty much had a, only owned a home or had a mortgage in a period where fixed rates were super low. Mm. And people were living in this sort of fantasy that that will occur again. Like it's unlikely. Like if we project forward and you say, right, we're just sitting at a variable rates, you know, on a home loan, it's four and a half percent. You're probably going to be paying 4.7, 4.8 for a fixed rate to lock in and pay for certainty. Um, People are still trying to think that, oh, it'll go all the way back down again. We're probably never ever going to see interest rates at that level that they were at when people were able to fix them Mm. at that period of time. So... We've got to be realistic about our expectations of what that is over the next 6, 12, 
20 years realistically. So how do you position yourself for that? You've got to have options. Can I ask a question of you, Amy? Practically, um, what have you been doing given that you winged it and you got your rate locked in until February? What, what have you been doing over the course of these last few years knowing that you're on a, a very, very low rate relative to what the variable rate is? And what have you got planned for the rate cliff that's coming? Well, I went to Europe, <laughs> so that <laughs> probably wasn't on the list to, to, as part of the plan. But um, I've started to, I guess, squirrel away a, a bit of a buffer. So um, I've spoken to a few close, helpful people that haven't given me any advice specifically. But to have that buffer in place before February next year is going to be really important for me um, to because I don't know what the rates will be this time next year. So it's a little bit of the unknown, but it's also known that it's definitely not going to be 1.99. I don't want to answer this for you, but maybe, you know, um, running a few projections on what will that be as a monthly outlay mm -hmm. if rates were at, you know, hypothetically they go come out and you're at six or they're at six and a half or if they were to be at five and trying to sort of benchmark and, and have an idea of, okay, that's what it would be, that's what it would be, that's what it would be and start to sort of mold that position that progressively buffer. and know that I can I can deal with that mm. um, for some people they'll do those numbers maybe they've already done them that, that they just can't make it work like it just doesn't functionally work mm. for them and that's where you become a distressed seller or something in their life has to change they got to generate more income cut their expenses or sell their house um, so maybe that's a quick last question. resort yeah sorry to interrupt when you said people need to write out the variable rates at the moment what what should they be doing to write it out I think that, is, it, we, is it getting a second job? Is it getting a renter in? Is it selling the house and depends. getting what you can? Yeah. It depends. And I think they're the options you got. You got simple, and we always talk about this, the really simple thing in, is you've got your current situation. You can increase your income, which is, you know, you work overtime, you take a second job, those sort of things. Well, can I just say before that, that the, the option of actually reviewing your existing arrangement, was, right, yeah. it is, um, maybe you're getting there, sorry to cut you off, but reviewing your existing arrangement and working out whether or not even though rates are still high, whether there's another provider that you can get potentially a better rate. However, a lot of people, because of the rate rise, are in what we call mortgage prison and they can't actually refinance. So they are literally stuck with what they have. And so then you've got to look at the other avenues of, can I increase revenue from some other source? And are there other expenses that I can reduce? Um, and again, there's diminishing returns with both of those because you've only got so much time mm. in the day to actually, uh, you know, work time for money. And there's only so far you can cut your expenses and, you know, you, 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 you get down to the bare bones, your non-discretionary expenses. And a lot of people, are, are, that's what they've done. There's no, there's no more room to cut. So in those instances, um, it's probably back to the last episode we talked about where you see a lot of people actually leaning on family members and saying, hey, I need some support. I can't get it from the bank. I can't work anymore. You're seeing people lean on family members, older family members with some wealth to actually help support them with their properties. Yeah. And even back to that sort of writing the variable rate, like that means you've don't go and tie yourself into an arrangement at this point. Like don't try and fix something or something. Like, negotiate with your bank so if you're in mortgage prison which we've done a podcast about where you you're sort of unable to actually move because of your serviceability talk to them talk to them and push them for a better rate most of the time you they'll give you something it might not be a lot but they'll give you something um if it's really really you know hard times they'll you know you might be able to go onto an interest only or on a pause but again that's we probably need to be seeking some serious advice around what's the viability of this long term mm. um something's probably not quite right there so as we sort of roll through this year and we get ready for that drop you want to be knowing where you stand and being ready for that so a lot of people have maybe now been able to build into their cash flow that they can afford it so they thought they couldn't they'd rejig some stuff expenses maybe they I don't know how many people have reviewed their home and contents insurance, their health provider, all those things that they hadn't done for a decade because they realized they had to. So now they've sort of functionally created a bit of surplus, which has then been used for that mortgage through the last couple of years. Now that as that comes out the back end, what, what do they do? Do they then reclaim that cash flow uh, as rates come down and they spend it? Do they go on the holiday they've been deferring? Do they continue to push it towards their mortgage and actually now go, right, well, sort of learnt the hard way that can get tough quickly let's mm. take a chunk out of it 
or do they invest with that surplus? It's going to be different for every single person. I think that's where the good thing is this won't happen quickly. We probably talked about rates not going up quickly um, and they went up rapidly, um, but it's still progressive. You've still got a month between each rise. You've got time to continue to recalibrate. As rates start to come down, it's probably going to be progressive as well, but you need to be get ahead of that. Start mm-hmm. thinking about, start projecting forward and going, okay, if rates did drop by this, then that means this. Yeah. And then start to plan what that new cash flow, again, new found, maybe reclaimed cash flow, has the biggest impact for you maybe that some people need to take some of that back into their living like they've they've gone without and that's mm. not what we want like our whole preface is to try and continue to live but also look at the future so trying to balance that up is is where we are in now for me and my mindset around those clients over the next 6 12 18 months yeah and even though every client situation is different i think the common thread with all of them is cash flow and getting so whether cash flow has been super good for you and you're you're preparing for the fact that it could be worse or cash flow has been dog shit for you uh, and you're trying to find ways to Im- improve it getting a handle on your cash flow well, again I, I do get sick of hearing myself say this all the time but cash flow is the cornerstone for any decision you make in your life financial or lifestyle so if you can get good at actually managing cash flow money in money out then you can make decisions about where it goes where do you place it do you put it in investments do you go to europe do you pay extra principal off your home uh do you help set up do you set up education funds for your kids do you make concessional contributions to super um the list is endless and that's the i suppose the exciting part about financial planning when people have their cash flow under control is they have so many levers to pull and gone then are the worries and concerns about shit i can't pay my mortgage or what's going to happen in february when rates go through the roof you're excited about hey i've got a surplus and um my decisions are what do i do with it like what what do i actually do with it and that's Mm -hmm. what we're trying to work towards for all clients is that they're not living paycheck to paycheck, that they've actually got surplus that we can help support them. And again, everyone's different. People come to us with plenty of cash flow and lots of options. Some come to us with challenges around finding the structure of their debt and their investments um, from the baseline. But uh, all in all, you've got to get your cash flow under control uh, to be able to make those decisions. Yeah, I think quality of life is something that Ben and I spoke about a lot earlier this year. You don't want to have to compromise on the things you're maybe used to doing or like doing but it's about balancing that with your cash flow and making sure it works for you long term not just yeah because i want to go out for tea four times this week because i like going out for tea some people some people have no result like they just do it like they absolutely no restraint on themselves yeah they say i I should be able to live the life i want to live yeah Yeah. but but at the cost of you know a credit card that grows that they can't pay off i again you got to take some level of well not some level you got to take personal responsibility with that and yeah there's a balance like sometimes you can't do everything you want to do and sometimes you got to make some hard decisions and sometimes you got to work harder or uh, make you know go and seek advice to make better decisions so you can have um, the deferred reward of having income later uh, yeah, I think this, I think this one, as we roll through the year, is probably going to be one of those things we continue to loop back on as we yeah. as we get more guidance, more idea of what it looks like, and start to see what the banks do with rates and stuff too. So I think we again we'll probably talk about this multiple times throughout the year, which will be interesting to see. Yep, how it unfolds. Uh, anything else, Amy? Any other concerns about your interest rate and your mortgage before we uh, we let you go and manage the practice? Manage no, I'll just keep running my questions past <laughs> Ben and Jay. It seems to work pretty well. All right. Awesome. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, business should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorized representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.